place in your homes. Pay very, very careful attention to the things you're about to hear tonight. I am speaking on the subject, the blessing of the bleeding. The blessing of the bleeding. Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 13 and 14. He said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He was hung on the cross where he bled then that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 He loves me I cannot say why He loves me I cannot say why Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 to 6 but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep we have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all the Lord bless his word in the name of Jesus. The blessing of the bleeding. Our objective tonight first is to understand the blessing of his bleeding on the cross. And second is to understand our access to the blessing. Understanding the blessing of his bleeding on the cross and then understanding our access to that blessing. By way of introduction, I want to say seven very important things regarding the crucifixion or regarding Calvary. First, the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important thing about Christianity. Is the most important, most powerful thing about Christianity. 
let me extend it. The crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in the history of mankind. His birth was very important. But his death, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection is the most important event in the history of mankind. First of all, I said it's the most important and most powerful thing about Christianity. Because at that occasion, God deployed his might, his force, his weight, his energy as the Almighty in the process. That is what makes Christianity Christianity. Number two, the best God did for humanity was to give all right before i go there let's let's look at colossians 2 13 to 15 to justify what i just said he said and you being dead in your sins and in the and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us he took it out of the way nailing it to his cross Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He made a show of them openly. That's why the crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in the history of mankind. God deployed his energy. Number two, the best God did for humanity was to give the best he had to, to die for the worst of men. He gave the best God did for humanity was to give the best he had to die for the worst of men or to die for the worst in men. Did you see what Romans chapter 5 verse 7 said? Romans chapter 5 verse 7. He said, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. That is, it will be hard for it to be said that this person is a holy person. And then somebody said, Let me die for him. Now, go further. He said, Yet peradventure for a good man. That is a person who is a very generous person. Very good. This man is a very good person. Some people may dare to die for such a person. He's a good man. He said, but in verse 8, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was no hope that we would change. The death was such a death that there was no assurance that we will believe in that death and change later. Look at what the living Bible said concerning that scripture of Romans chapter 5 verse 7 and 8. Romans 5 7 and 8. Even if we were good, we really wouldn't expect anyone to die for us. Though of course, that might be barely possible. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See what the Amplified said. Now it is an extraordinary thing for one to willingly give his life even for an upright man. Though perhaps for a good man, that is somebody who is noble and selfless and worthy, someone might even dare to die for such a person. But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that why we were still sinners, active sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Christianity is all about. Now look at how rugged the message Bible puts it. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. The message Bible said, we can understand someone dying for a person, what dying for? We can understand someone dying for a person who is worth dying for. And we can understand 
how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. He offered his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use. That, that, that is, we are of no benefit. There was no hope that would be anything. Even up till now, there are people who don't think God is anything. That is the kind of death Jesus died. The best God did for humanity was to give the best he had to die for the worst in men or the worst of men. The worst in, in bracket, of men. Am I communicating? The Bible said, He that spared not his only son, why will he not with him give us all other things? That is the point number two. Number three, the cross was the place of reparation. Reparation. Payment. That was what the cross symbolizes. A place of reparation. A place of payment. That's right. The sinless son of God was paying for the sinful consequences of the sinful acts of sinful men. The sinless son of God was paying for the sinful consequences of the sinful acts of sinful men. That is what today signifies. Calvary. You have heard the song we owed the debt we couldn't pay and he paid the debt he didn't owe. 1 Corinthians 5 2 Corinthians 5 21 he made him to be seen who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 That was what happened. He paid, he paid, he paid. He made him to be seen. That is what the cross signifies. Number four, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was God's rescue operation from all claims of the enemy on man. It was God's rescue operation. God's rescue operation of all claims of the enemy on man. It is by, because of the cross that we can say I owe the devil nothing. All claims. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 and 19, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 and 19, Zekoko Barataya. He said, for as much as you know that you were re not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers but you were redeemed redeemed means rescued bought back by the blood of jesus christ he bought us back first corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 said you are bought with a price you are bought with a price you are not your own on calvary many 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 years ago at Passover, Jesus offered himself to buy us back. Every time I preach this, around this area, I remember the story of the little boat. I'm sure you remember the little boat. The little boat of the farmer, of the, of the, of the fisherman. Who took his time to create the boat. Carved it very well to his liking. And he was using the boat. He anchored the boat on the seashore and one day, a wind and a storm or whatever it is, caught the anchor and then the boat was lost. On top of the sea, it disappeared. Some little, some uh, other fishermen saw the boat somewhere, harvested it and went and sold it. And then someone bought it and put it in his shop as display for sale. 
The owner of this boat looked for the boat and it's not that he couldn't make another boat, but he had an attachment to this boat that he took his time to carve and to create. Suddenly, he heard that a boat that looked like his boat was on display in a shop. When he got to that shop, he, he saw the, his boat, recognized his little boat, and he told the shopman that he's the owner of the boat, that the boat got lost and so on. The man could not understand. The man told him, I'm sorry, I know it's, your, it's, uh, it's possible it's your boat and your story looks true. He said, but I bought it. They sold it to me. All I need for you is to pay me the money I, I, I paid them to get the boat. You get it back. The man had to go and work and labor until he was able to gather the money. Obviously, he agreed with the boat seller not to sell it to any other person that he's coming to buy it. And then he returned back when he had made the money and bought the boat. Carried the boat with so much excitement and sat down with celebration, tapping the boat as if it was a person. He said, little boat, little boat. I now own you twice. First I created you. And now I have bought you. I am your owner twice. I created you. I manufactured you with my hands. You got lost. Then I went and paid for you again. Even though I owned you. Even though I made you. Because you got lost and got sold off. I had to pay again to buy you. So I am now your owner twice. I made you and I bought you. That is how every child of born again child of God is. He is our owner twice. He made us, created us in his image and we got lost. Hopelessly lost in sin. Lost in the traditions, in the things of this life. And then he sent his son Jesus again to die for us and bought us again. So we are his creation. And we are his property. He created us. Then he redeemed us. That is what Calvary is all about. The cross is the place of payment, of reparation. Uh, uh, and then the place of rescue. Number five. The cross, the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, on the cross of Calvary was God's solution to the complexities of man's challenges. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Cal Calvary was God's solution to the complexities of man's challenges. The cross was solution spot, was and is our solution spot. In the cross, at the cross, when I first saw the light And the burdens of my heart He rolled away It was then by faith I received my sight And now I am happy Praise the Lord At a cross, at a cross, when I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart, he rolled away. It was then perfect. I received my sight. And now I am happy. Oh. Solution. Every time you are surrounded with complexities of situations, remember the cross. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, concerning Jesus, the Bible said, He shall his name is and she shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save. Save means solve. He shall solve the same problem of his people. He shall dismantle and decomplicate the complexities of the people. 
there is no problem and no challenge you have as a man as a person that is not handleable by the cross matthew chapter 1 verse 21 the sacrifice of the cross was god's solution to the complexities number six the sacrifice of christ on the cross was the facilitator of the reunion of God and man. The cross is the facilitator of the reunion of God and man. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 to 19. If any man is in Christ, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 17 to 19. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new verse 18 and 19 and all things are of god who has reconciled us to himself by jesus christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation the cross is the junction of reconciliation is the junction of reunion is the junction of reconnection between god and man the junction of reunion the junction of connection Man was hopelessly lost when God drove man from the Garden of Eden. People began to wander, wander into all manner of religions in search of God. Again, that is the difference between Christianity and any other thing. Religion is man looking for God. Christianity is God searching for man. God searched for man by sending his son Jesus to locate man. That is why we are here. The cross is the facilitator. Of the reunion between God and man. Finally, the cross of Calvary is the cross is was and is the junction of exchange of man's worst for God's best. The junction of exchange. The sacrifice of the cross facilitated what I call the great exchange. The worst of man was exchanged for the best of God. The cross became the junction, the humano divinity junction. It's a junction where the Son of God became the Son of Man and made it possible for sons of men to become children of God. It's a junction. A junction, a crossover junction. Where people bound for hell can change direction. Junction. And for the rest of this message, I'll be concentrating my effort, focus on the exchange of the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 He was made sin for he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'd like you to listen to me for the remaining part of this message. If you can understand the cross and understand Calvary then the majority of the challenge you have in life will be over. In fact, every, every one of them. Jesus did not only die so that you can escape from hell and go to heaven. That is a major matter in it. That's in fact the most important. But there are other things before that heaven and hell, before you reach there. There are other things that his death was meant to handle for you. What was the exchange? Number one, he took our unrighteousness so that we can take on his righteousness. He took our unrighteousness, our filthiness, our sinfulness. If not for the death of Christ on Calvary, none of us can even be righteous enough to approach God. He took our unrighteousness so that we can take on his righteousness. It is by the righteousness of God that we walk with God. By his righteousness we access heaven.
What a faithful God. The Bible says if God will mark iniquity, who will stand? You didn't commit fornication. You didn't commit adultery. You didn't steal. You didn't lie. You didn't do any of those things. But that tiny pride that was there that could have taken you to hell. That tiny bitterness and jealousy and anger. That tiny, tiny, whatever it is that you ignore, that the devil is hold, trying to hold. It is the righteousness of Jesus that, that, that makes you qualify to be pardoned of such. He took our unrighteousness so we can take on his righteousness. Second, that was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Number two, he took our hurt so we can take his health. He took your hurt. Let me talk to you directly. He took your unrighteousness. Okay, let's go. He took our hurt. Or pain so we can take his health in Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 5 to 6 we read that already in the text he was wounded he was hot for our transgression he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed he was hot that we might be healed his pain is our gain the sickness that should have sickened you, sickened him. Every affliction or disease the devil wants to, you to carry in your lifetime, he carried it. That is why he cursed every demon of disease and affliction, tying you down. Every demon of diabetes or hypertension, inherited diseases. Today is your end. In the name of Jesus. If there is no other day you can claim your healing, today is a day. The day that the death is marked. The day that this crucifixion is marked. You lay hold on the horns of the altar and say, Lord, if your death is, your crucifixion is being marked today, and this is one reason why you were crucified, then I cannot cross from today into tomorrow with that affliction. With that ear condition, with that eye condition with that with that liver condition with that with that coronavirus symptom i can't cross from today into tomorrow without affliction it took our heart so we can take his health number three he took our wretchedness so we can take his blessedness his bleeding was our blessing he took our wretchedness so we can take his blessedness. His nakedness was our clothedness. If you pardon me the use of that word. On Calvary they stripped him naked. He had nothing to drink, no water. They gave him vinegar. He had no shelter on his head. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 said, for we know the, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might be rich, might be made rich. This is scripture. He was made poor. He was stripped naked. Revelation chapter 5 verse 12 said, What is the lamb that was slain? What is, and I saw in verse 12, What is the lamb that was slain to receive power, to receive riches, to receive wisdom? To receive strength, to receive honor, to receive glory, and to receive blessing. He was slain. Part of the reason why he was slain was to receive on your behalf riches and blessing. You are not permitted to, you are not permitted to carry generational wretchedness. You are not permitted to transmit generational poverty. The welfare of man is in the package of redemption. Living pitiable, living beggarly is not your portion. Living as a shame, living as a reproach to redemption is not your portion. Christianity is not synonymous with poverty. Look at those two scriptures. It took our wretchedness so we can take his blessedness. 
Number four, he took our costfulness so we can receive his costlessness. Costful. I mean, well, especially in Africa here, costs are so plenty. Inability to get married on time, get married, inability to get children, all manner of ancestral generational family curses and witchcraft to cover manipulations, all manner. Jesus took it on Calvary. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the Lord. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Be made a curse for us as it is written. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. He hung on a tree. That was the curse he carried. That we might re receive the blessing of Abraham. It doesn't matter the family, the family you came from. It doesn't matter the village you have come from. It doesn't matter the transactions your fathers and your forefathers entered into. It doesn't matter blood sacrifices that have been shared on your behalf, on the behalf of your lineage. It holds no water as far as Calvary is concerned. He couldn't be cursed. He was costless. You can't be cursed, fool. And like I said earlier on, on a day like this, you can make demands. You can, you can be exempted from the liabilities of your lineage, exempted from the calamities of your father's house, exempted from the things that the devil is insisting on imposing on your life. Today is your day of freedom. Number five, he took our debt. He took our place in debt so we can take his place in life. Yes. He took our place in death so we could take his place in life. He took our place in death so we can take his place in life. He died our death so we can live his life. He died our death so we can live his life. So we can live the life he should live. You know when they came to arrest him? In John chapter 18 verse 6. And he asked his arrestors, who are you looking for? And as soon as he said to them and they said, Jesus of Nazareth, they say, I am the one. They fell backward and fell to the ground. If you read it from the first verse. And then in verse 7, he asked them again. Then he asked again, Who seek he? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 8, he said, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let this go their way. The only condition I will surrender myself to, the, I will surrender myself to be arrested is that none of these my followers will be arrested to die with me. And he said that it might be fulfilled in verse 9. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken. Which, which he spake of them which thou givest me. I have lost none. Do you understand that? He surrendered himself to die young. So that you can live long. Don't, don't bow cheaply to any demon force of death. In Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 9, the Bible says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, that is temporarily accepted to be a man, for, because of that death. He was crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. He should taste it. That is, he should die your death, so you live his life. He should die young, so you can live long. Doesn't matter who died prematurely in your lineage. It doesn't matter how surrounded you are with the forces of death. It doesn't matter how many times death attempted you. You are not permitted to die before your time by the virtue of Calvary. And you can make up that decision and force it to happen today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Number six, he was despised. This is very important. He was despised so that we can be esteemed. He was devalued so we can have value. Christianity is an enemy of inferiority. Inferiority complex. Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 3. Isaiah 53 and in verse 3. Lekosa is despised, rejected of men. That was part of what he had to go through. Despised and rejected. Devalued. So you can be envalued. They sold him for 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave. 
they negotiated and sold him for 30 pieces of silver. So that nobody can transact on your head. And devalue and reduce you to nothing. If you are a real child of God, you are one of those who refuse to, to, to die of low self-esteem. You are one of those who, you are, according to John Gillick, a child of God is the wildest kind of the most enthusiastic optimist in the world. That is enthusiastic, optimistic, positivistic, a bundle of energy. The energy of the one who valued you. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 9, he said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a quality person, a holy nation, a peculiar person, not a riffraff. Not an area boy, area girl. Not a despicable anything. Not somebody to be tolerated or taken for granted. Christian people don't know who they are. They don't know what Christ has done for them. He said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 27, 28. Christ in you is the allocation of dignity. Christ in you is the allocation of quality. Christ in you is the enhancement of value. <laughs> that is why some of us move with a lot of audacity. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of. I have never felt inferior to anybody anywhere in this world. Because I am too aware of who I am in Christ. What I am talking about and preaching about now is blasting off every demon of low self-worth. Every demon of inferiority. I don't care how people, how your growing up days was like. People talk down on you, look down on you. You were never good enough. Nothing you did was good enough. There are people they've compared you with other people, even your mother, your father, your brothers, your siblings. They don't think you are, you are anything. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. After all, they never thought David was anything. But he became somebody. He was despised. And I'm talking to somebody. He was despised. So you can be esteemed. He was devalued so you can have value in life. Number seven, he was rejected so you can be accepted. One of the greatest challenges in our world today is this challenge of rejection. Jesus was rejected so you can be accepted. Say it this way, he suffered rejection. So you can experience celebration. So you can experience acceptance. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, where we read, said he was despised and rejected of men. Can you imagine the king of kings, the lord of lords, the I am that I am, the, the, the rose of Sharon, the one who was not created, elect, elected, nominated, selected, or appointed by man. That one was rejected. So don't be, don't feel too bad that human beings around you are trying to play any game of rejection. You are not rejected. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 to 6, Ephesians chapter 1, he said, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted. In the beloved. Made us accepted. In the beloved. He made us as accepted. You are too accepted to be rejected by man. And don't allow any demon of rejection follow you. Now let me say it. When your mother gave birth to you. Your father said. You are not. He is not the owner of the child. You grew up with rejection. Your father left you and your brothers and your siblings and everybody for your mother to take care of you. You felt abandoned and rejected and you grew up with it. Jesus got you covered. <clears throat> you were qualified for the position. They rejected you and gave somebody else on the, on the ground of partiality and favoritism and tribalism and nepotism and ethnicity and clanism, clannishness. God got you covered. 
young man said he's not going to marry you again or a young girl said they are not going to marry you again and you have experienced that five six seven times the devil knows your potential he's just trying to rob rejection on you and it is never your portion and all of you going about behaving like satan the devil agents of rejection you don't want to marry the girl you gave her hope and just just lifted up her hope tomorrow you say I'm, I, I will marry again next tomorrow you find another one I will marry again are you a demon real people give value to others real children of God real real valuable people allocate value to others they are not agents of rejection You did so well outstandingly and then they said they don't want you again in your place of work. And you feel rejected. Let me tell you. If you have done your best, you are a child of God. You are excellent. You are superb in what you do. That place is not yours. They don't know your value. You are too, you are too valuable for them. The real place of your value is coming. In that case, you didn't lose a job. Job lost you. In time to come, they will know who you are. Am I communicating at all? I curse every demon of rejection that has made you feel lower than others. Command it to die today in the name of Jesus. Don't die of stone coming suicide. That man who left you and your young boy, don't, just leave him alone. Let God handle him. But don't die because of another person's behavior. You are not rejected. Celebrate yourself after this moment's ministration. Decorate yourself when the doors are open. Show the devil that you are too accepted by God to be rejected by man. And it doesn't matter anyway what man says, provided God has said yes to you. He was rejected so you can be accepted. He suffered rejection so you can suffer, experience acceptance <laughs> and celebration. Number eight. He took our grief and sorrow so we can take his joy and pleasure. You know, the only thing Jesus did not know was depression. He only cried once at the top of Lazarus and that was for the calamity of humanity. But he became a man of sorrow on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 4. He became a man of sorrow on the cross. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He carried our griefs. He carried our sorrows on the cross. In the Messianic prof prophetic writing of Isaiah, in, in Isaiah chapter 61 from verse 1 to 3, he was talking about Jesus Christ and what he was coming to do. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, the Lord has anointed me, anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, he said, the open, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of God to comfort all that, that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beautiful ashes, the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. In other words, part of his assignment to humanity is to replace your sorrow and your grief with joy and pleasure. That is, you can deploy the blood of Jesus against every root of consistent grief. Every root, whatever is a continuous root of sadness in your life, a continuous root of grief, a continuous root of grief the blood of Jesus is against you by the workings of the cross of Calvary the one who carried my sorrow who carried my grief you can't devil you can't be grieving me you can't be causing me pain all the time you can't be causing me sorrow I reject you I curse you root of sorrow by the blood of Jesus and by the power of the cross of Calvary for everyone here today Every single year you bury someone in your family. Every time negative things happen, car caught fire, something happened, something, something, something. Just in chain like that to cause you continuous pain and sorrow and sadness. Today, by the speakings of the blood of Jesus, that cycle of sorrow is 
cut off. It expires now. That cycle of grief is arrested by the power of the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He took our grief and sorrow so you can take his joy and pleasure. Can you see that there is more to Calvary? So much, so much to Calvary than just um, have given my life to Christ and I'm now a good person. There is so much more. Number nine. It took our, it took our pressure so we can take his peace. Pressure, troubles, crisis, so we can take his peace. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3, he said that. Peace. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid our situation, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That's the place. The chastisement of our peace. Anything that is to take peace from us was laid on him. Whatever puts our peace under pressure, he carried it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd like you to look at the living Bible of that verse 5. The living Bible of that verse 5. See what he said? Isaiah chapter 53. But he was wounded for our um, wounded and bruised for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. Eh? That you might have peace. He was lashed and we were healed. He was beaten that we might have peace. <laughs> what of the amplified version? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. That well-being is peace. Whatever is needed for us to have peace was laid on him. You know, there are people who are permanently under pressure. Life tensed up, tensed up. There is a quality of peace. There is a quality, there is such an abundance of supernatural resources unruffled. In the course of our construction, the construction of the glory dome, a couple of people came and when they saw me, <laughs> one um, evangelist, Frontline man of God. You see, you are so calm. You are so normal. You see, I, I was expecting you to be under pressure. He said, do you sleep in the night? Are you, do you sleep? I said, I sleep very well. There is not a trace of worry one day concerning the, that, the season of that construction. Not then, not now. I've seen people come into, into my office and they say, oh, the peace around is so heavy. I don't, I don't feel like going. Deborah has sat with me in the office. Oh, the whole place is just so peaceful. Everything is so, just so peaceful. Everything is just so calm. There's no worry at all. It's an asset. The devil's plan is to put your life permanently under pressure. To make you worry over one thing after another, after another permanently. But Calvary guarantees your peace. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace. And from today, by the power of Calvary, I declare the expiration of every form of pressure and every form of trouble in your life in the name of Jesus. And number 10. He took your place in hell so you can find your place in heaven. He took our place in hell so we can find our place in heaven. Somebody say, how is that? Oh, yes. Between the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection, part of the pathway included passage through hell. That was where he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. 
He went to the headquarters of demons and defeated them there. He couldn't have said all power is in heaven and on earth is given unto me if he didn't go to Satan's headquarter and defeat him there. And then the Messianic Psalm, Psalm is David, spoke about it in, in Psalm 16 verse 8 to 11. Psalm 16 verse 8 to verse 11. He said, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you allow your Holy One to suffer degeneration. Corruption. Thou will show me the path of life. That was what led to the resurrection. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. There was that passage there. Because the claims of justice must be met. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That death is eternal hell. If he is to take our sins and bear the consequences, he was, he, he was meant to pass through whatever we are meant to pass through. He suffered for all of humanity all at once within three days. Eternities of suffering laid on him. Look at that in Acts chapter 2 verse 22 to, to verse 27. It was made clear by Peter. You men of Israel, hear this was. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain. Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, therefore, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you allow, suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Do you know the meaning of that? Anybody who ends in hell, it is their choice. Jesus already passed through that way, so you don't end there. Just like anybody who lives in sin today, it is, is their choice. Beloved, isn't it wonderful to appreciate God for Calvary? Too loaded. Carried our unrighteousness so we can take his righteousness. Took our heart so we can take his health. Took our wretchedness so we can take his blessedness. Took our cursefulness so we can receive his curselessness. No devil, no witch can curse him. He took our place in death so we can take his place. In life. Place in life. Place in death so we can take his place in life. In life. He died so we can take his place in life. Yes. He died young so we can live long. He died the death we should have died so we can live the life he should live. Six, he was despised so we can be esteemed. He was devalued so we can have value. He was rejected so we can be accepted. He suffered rejection so we can experience acceptance. He took our grief and sorrow so we can take his joy and pleasure. He took our pressures and troubles so we can take his peace and rest. He took our place in hell so we can find our place in heaven. How do you access this blessing? I think I've over preached today but today requires such preaching. How do you access the blessing of his bleeding? Everything I have mentioned so far are the blessing of his bleeding. How do you access it? Number one, receive his sacrificial death on the cross for you. Receive his sacrificial death on the cross for you. Receive him into your life as your Lord and Savior. For as many as received him, he gave them the power. John chapter 1 verse 12 to become
the sons of God. Receive him. Don't play church. Be real. Don't just be a church goer. Be real. Receive him as your savior. Number two, deepen your understanding of your benefits in redemption. Deepen your understanding because your faith is anchored on your understanding. Your benefits in redemption. Truth is, you can't apprehend what you don't comprehend. That's the truth. What you don't understand, you can never, you can never, a journey you don't understand, you can't undertake. Deepen your understanding. For the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed, they belong to us. What is not your revelation can never be your possession. You possess it to the extent to which it has been revealed. Psalm 49 verse 20 said, man that is in honor and does not understand is like a beast that perish. God said, Jesus was despised so you can be esteemed. And you are moving up and down with low self-esteem and inferiority mentality. You are moving up and down celebrating depression and rejection. While all that has been taken care of by Calvary. Deepen your understanding. Deepen your understanding. Of your benefits in redemption. Deep in your understanding. You see there are some things you understand. That just make you behave in some very rugged ways. One day I was talking with my wife. And. I told her I said. If I can't believe God for this. How will I be able to believe God for that? This is a minor thing. Everything happens according to Faith Smith. Wigglesworth, at a point, had kidney stones on. And he had to urinate with pain. Urinate out stones, very solid, bulky stones. At times, he would, the pressure was so terrible. He needed to go for surgery. Now, if your faith is not at his level, don't operate there. Know what he said? See, I better die trusting God than to live the rest of my life in doubt not knowing what to believe <laughs> if God is my healer let him heal me and if I'm not sure he is my healer then and of course he was healed deepen your understanding what is it that is yours in God deepen your understanding Number three, appropriate your inheritance by faith. That was what Job said. Even if it appears lost, doesn't mean lost in sin. It means even if I can't find my bearing, I'm trying to, what, what is my next step? Even if I don't know the next step to take, Lord, I won't, I won't let go. That is when you know what is yours. You appropriate your inheritance by faith. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 that we should not be slothful, but be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. I received a sacrificial death on Calvary. I deepened my understanding. You listen to messages like this, transactions of the cross. The purpose of Calvary. Such messages. Good Friday messages. Easter Sunday messages. Those messages. And you understand these things. You appropriate them. You take them in. You force them to be real in your life. And then. You walk in the reality of them. Please understand that light is reflective. Anywhere you see light. It shines. If the light of scripture in this area is in you, it fends off darkness. The darkness of depression, the darkness of affliction, and the darkness of rejection. Welcome to Good Friday 2020. We shall see God 
like never before. And the God of resurrection will prove himself in this season. Prove himself to the nations of the earth and prove himself to coronavirus disease and prove himself in your life. I know somebody is blessed without any doubt that his bleeding has produced for you the blessing. You will stand up on your feet where you are, lift up your hands and give him the praise. Give him the honor. Give him the adoration. Give him the worship. Give him the supremacy. The dominion, the rule, the sovereignty. Father, we love you. Father, we honor you. Father, we adore you. Father, we give you the praise. Father, we give you the praise. Father, we give you the honor. Father, we give you the adoration. Father, we give you the praise. Father, we give you the praise. Father, we give you the praise. Father, we give you the adoration. Worship to your name. Lift your hands and appreciate him. Lift your hands and honor him. Lift your hands and worship him. Lift your voice and thank 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 him. Lift your voice and praise him. Honor him. Adore him. In Jesus' precious name. You will lift your hands and thank him for Calvary. Thank him for the blood that was shed on Calvary. Thank him for the flow of the blood. Thank him for the sacrifice of Jesus. Lift your voice and say after me and say, Father, I thank you for Calvary. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary. To give me life. To give me help. To give me direction. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you, Master, in the name of Jesus. Lift your voice and speak to God. Appreciate him for Calvary. Appreciate him for Calvary. Appreciate him for Calvary. Appreciate him. Appreciate him for the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. The sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. The flow of the blood. The flow of the blood. The flow of the blood. We appreciate you for Calvary. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. We honor you for the blood. We appreciate you for the blood. Let us see. Yes, we appreciate you. We honor you and thank you for Calvary. Blessed be your name in the name of Jesus Christ.